Uh, thanks, Gustavo. Um, I'm going to be talking about building a brain tumor practice and center. Uh, and although it says brain tumors, this is, as, just, as, as you heard, this is really applicable to all of neurosurgery. So spine, vascular, functional, peds, doesn't really matter. Um, the concepts are the same. How do you build a practice? How do you build a program? I'm going to go over a little bit about what we did down in Miami. Um, what's, a, what's also important to know is that this is something that you'll never learn during residency, just like Gustavo said. Um, this is something that, you know, you guys learn how to take care of the patients. You guys come to work. There's, there's someone here in the operating room. You take care of them. They go home. But you end up having no idea where the patients come from as a resident. I remember, you know, these people show up, and you, it's, it's almost as important to know where the patients come from. How do you get the patients as opposed to just taking care of them. And that's a, that's a critical skill uh, that's never taught during residency. So something we want to focus on, just like Gustavo said, for all the chiefs and fellows and, and really junior attendings. So we'll start by talking about what exactly is a medical practice. Um, so really, if you look at the bottom, just for us neurosurgeons, it's the number of patients that you treat. It's the volume of patients that you see in clinic, that you treat surgically. And that's really what your medical practice um, is defined as. So the next question is, why is it important to have a practice, right? Why should we strive to build a practice? What's the benefit? Um, is it really worth all the time and effort? And that's exactly what it takes. It takes a lot of time and a lot of effort in terms of building a practice. Um, and like I said, it's really never taught in residency. You guys show up, you guys learn, you know, learn how to take care of the patients, and then you're put out to your practice and you're trying to get patients, but you have absolutely no idea where the attendings get the patients from. And I think that's part of residency, which is really lacking. So what are the benefits? You know, why should we build a practice? Well, so if, so if you're in private practice, it's pretty clear that's the revenue. Cases are your enterprise. Cases are how you generate uh, money, and you clearly need to do cases if you're in private practice. But, but if you look at academia, it's a little bit less clear. Um, you know, there's, there's usually not a direct financial correlation. Uh, there's, there, there's usually incentives, but a lot of departments have salaries. And so again, there's doctors who can survive um, in academia despite being in the red, and they would never survive if, if they were in private practice. So then the question is, why build a practice in academia, right? Mainly salaried, what's the incentive? You know, I remember being a resident, seeing attendings doing, you know, working, working their ass off, really, and you're wondering to yourself, if you're doing one case a week as opposed to 10, and you're getting paid the same, why would you work so hard? And I remember telling myself, I'll never work that hard. Uh, and boy, was I wrong. I've worked harder as an attending than I have as a resident. Um, and again, it's, 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 it's looking at why do you want to put that work in? What's the benefit of having a practice? And the answer is volume is power. And I can't really emphasize this enough to all of the graduating chief residents, right? Volume is expertise. So just like playing a sport, if you're playing golf every day, as opposed to once a month, you're going to be a lot better. So, so for the complex spine, complex tumors, complex vascular, if you're doing these cases day in and day out, better outcomes, more comfortable, and you become an expert in your field. Uh, volume is training, so if you're going to have fellows, if you're going to if you're going to produce the next leaders in the field, residents and fellows need to see these cases early and often. So volume really improves your training. Uh, volume is data, research, clinical trials, especially when it comes to brain tumors. You can't really run clinical trials if you're doing one glioma a month. Uh, volume is also um, reputation, both locally, nationally, internationally, and then finally, most importantly, volume is what's going to lead to building a program. So. You know, every program has needs. You need certain support, you need certain equipment. And if you're doing one case a week and you go to admin and you say, we need A, B, and C, no one's listening to you. If you're doing 10 cases a week, 12 cases a week, now you have the ear of the administrators. At the end of the day, money talks. And so building a program, the key is you need the volume first and then everything else falls into place. If you start making requests and you don't have the volume, it usually falls on, on, on deaf ears. So you gotta, you gotta really have that core centerpiece first and then the and then the institution will, will be behind you once they see that the money is being generated. So the next question, how do you build volume? Well, it's very complex. Obviously, it's not just a simple five-minute discussion. Uh, but, but it really requires work. And that requires everything outside of the operating room. Because I always tell the residents, surgery is the easy part of neurosurgery. You're in the operating room. No one's bothering you. You're doing what you love. That's the easy part. It's when you get out of the operating room and everything else that goes into building a program uh, that really requires work. And if you just go to work and you go to the operating room and you go home, you're never gonna build a program and you're never really gonna build a practice. You gotta put in the work outside of the operating room. 
And the question is, there's a lot of talented surgeons out there. We all think we go, you know, that we're good and we are good, but there's a lot of talented surgeons out there, a lot of options. Why would the referring doctor send you a patient? And that's, what, that's the question you have to ask yourself as you're starting to build your practice. So the three A's, um, availability, affability, ability. I'm sure everyone's heard this, but these three A's drive um, referral patterns, period. These three A's pretty much determine who builds a practice, who builds a program. So one is being available, pretty obvious. Answer your phone, answer your email. It can't just be your office. People have to be able to reach you easily. If someone has a patient in neurosurgery and they want it seen, very tough to go through the office. Um, they have to be able to reach you directly. Um, affability, pretty simple, just be nice. Obviously, if people don't like working with you, if you're rude on the phone, people aren't, aren't really gonna send you patients. Um, and finally is you know how good you are, and that's actually the least important, which is shocking. So we all know a lot of doctors who are very successful who aren't very good. And the bottom line is they probably hit the first two A's. But if you can get all three A's, if you can be available, people like working with you, and on top of that, you're a good doctor, that's when you can really build a great program. So you gotta focus on these three A's when you're first starting out. So then how do you translate that into building a program, right? Building a practice is one thing, that's just one person. How do you build a program? Well, there's a lot of steps uh, which we did down in Miami, and I'll go over all of these, uh, talking about how these translated into building a brain tumor center. And so like I said, when I joined uh, UM back in 2011, the goal was to really build a center. Uh, and there wasn't much there, the case volume was low. Uh, so the number one priority, again, as I said, was to really build case volume. After that, we wanted to start a fellowship, train the future leaders, uh, bring in surgical uh, techniques, which are cutting edge, uh, start a tumor bank, database, clinical trials, translational research, all of that was critical towards the center. But as you see, the number one priority is case volume, and that's, that's what I was brought down to UM to do. So what were the challenges that we faced? And I think a lot of hospitals have these challenges. So the Brain Tumor Center was uh, headed at one of the small smaller hospitals, which was um, just across the street from Jackson Memorial. Uh, they had purchased it back in 2011, uh, back when I started. And so what were the challenges about building brain tumor volume at this new hospital? One small ER, so there's no guaranteed cases. So cases, so hospitals that have a large ER, those are guaranteed cases, cases you don't have to work for. They come through the ER, they're yours, they're surgical, and you don't have to work for those referrals. Uh, this hospital, unfortunately, had a very small ER, almost like an urgy care center. So the amount of brain tumors that came through that ER were less than five a year, I would say. So really no guaranteed cases. Uh, two, really no experience treating brain tumors. So the nurses, the techs, the OR staff, the equipment really had never dealt with these complex cases. So you're starting from scratch, and that's obviously a challenge. And then finally, this used to be a small private hospital called Cedars, and so you have those private networks that you have to crack into. And I think anyone who's trying to start out uh, needs to know that there are these referral patterns that are kind of ingrained, especially amongst these private practitioners. And really cracking into that can be very, very difficult. And that was a big challenge of ours. So one, targeted faculty recruitment. This is the first step if you're gonna build any program, vascular, spine, <clears throat> peds, trauma. And that person needs to be a clinical workhorse. You don't start a program by bringing in a researcher, a 50-50 guy. That's almost like a sixth man in basketball. You, if you, you need to have a clinical workhorse in whatever specialty you're gonna develop a program in, generate the volume, and then all of the supplementary people, researcher guys, 50-50, those, they all come second. But if you're trying to build a program and you get a researcher first, in my opinion, that's backwards. You gotta, you gotta first generate that volume. Number two, aggressive referral network development. So you gotta really raise awareness about your program. So if you start a program, um, really people don't know about it because it's brand new. So how do, you, how do you educate the public? How do you educate physicians as to, as to this excellent program which you're building? And so we went on a mission to inform South Florida about our new brain tumor program down at UM. Googled South Florida hospitals, 92 hospitals between Key West up to the Treasure Coast, out to Naples, so about a 400 mile radius. Uh, some of these are tiny little psych hospitals. Other ones were major hospitals, kind of like Mount Sinai, Baptist. And so all these hospitals have to have some kind of CME event. So, I, so we contacted each of these hospitals, uh, had a positive response from 77. So gave 77 talks over 18 months at all these hospitals talking about our brain tumor program with the goal of having these people understand what's available for them and their patients. 
And so what did these talks emphasize? So as I said, really the three A's, by far the most important, talking about how we can see their patients right away, uh, how, we're, how we're obviously nice to their patients and them, and also how, our, how the outcomes are better. What are we doing differently at UM? So that's obviously a key thing. So if you're starting a program, what makes you different than all of those private practitioners? Surgical innovation, excellent outcomes. And these are some of the surgical uh, techniques, which I'm sure you guys all use here, awake craniotomies, advanced neuronavigation, laser ablation, brain path vicor, minimally invasive systems, fluorescence guided tumor resection, and then vaccine-based clinical trials. This is what separates academia from the private practitioners. And so all the talks that we gave emphasized that so that they understood that there was a higher level of care at a university setting. And finally, you always want to end the talk with how do you get the patients seen? Because at the end of the day, that's what they care about. They don't care that you're doing away craniotomies. They want to know, what, how can I get my patients seen by you quickly? So you give out personal information, contact information, and you explain how the patient gets seen right away. And that's, that's the key part of any talk. Um, community outreach. So got involved with a lot of the um, support groups. So a lot of the referrals come through these support groups. If you're involved in these support groups, you really increase your footprint in terms of patient referrals. So the Florida Brain Tumor Association, Voices Against Brain Cancer, <coughs> PAPCOR, which is a cancer group, um, Women's Cancer Association, you know, meet with them, go to their galas, give talks. I mean, a lot of the referrals come just through patients, you know, talking amongst themselves. And so I think community outreach, again, you know, regardless of what type of program you're building, got to reach out, get involved in terms of these support groups. Um, expanded encatchment area. So, you know, where are you going to focus your efforts? You have to see where is the best ROI. So when I got there, I looked, and Dade County, which is where, you know, um, UM is, we basically had, had that pretty well handled. If you look at the market share, they already had 80, 90% of the tumors coming that way. But up north, Broward, Palm Beach, really very few tumors were coming down to UM. Most of them were being treated at, at, at a lot of the local hospitals. So I think if you're going to start a program, you've got to identify where is the gap. Where, where are you missing out on those patients? And then focus your efforts on that area. If you focus your uh, efforts on an area where already you're dominating, obviously that's not going to have a high, you know, high ROI. So I identified Broward, Palm Beach, up to the Treasure Coast, where really all these tumors were going up to Duke. They were going up to New York. Uh, and so focused a lot of the effort on these areas where patients were going elsewhere for their care. Um, facilitated referrals. So, you've, so, so now you've educated all the physicians. You've educated all the groups, and, 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 now, and, and now people know about what you're offering, but really, it's not enough, right? So, so, so you have to be available, and that doesn't, that's not your office, it's not your fax, because in the year 2018, people have to reach you over your cell phone, or email, or text. Um, that's absolutely critical. If people are relying, calling your office, very, very difficult to get patients in, because we know how difficult that entire intake process can be. And I always say that the most able doctor, the best surgeon, doesn't always get the cases. It's the most available. And hopefully those two go together. But I can tell you, just being available alone will generate cases. And then on top of that, if you're good, that's when you can really build. But it's not enough that you're available. So, so some doctor calls you and they say, hey, Johnny, I have Mark who has an aneurysm. I want him seen. You know, the answer can't be, great, have them call my office, because you basically wasted that doctor's time, you've wasted your time. They, of course, they know your office number, they could have done that originally. The answer has to be, sounds great, what's the name and number of the patient, I'll take it from here. Take it off that doctor's hands, they're gonna be super happy about that, and then you give that to your assistant and you have them call the patient and get them in right away. So you have to make it easy for, for, for that doctor. Always put yourself in the shoes of, of, that, of that referring doctor. A Lot of options, a lot of good surgeons out there, why would he send it to you? And number one is, ease of making that referral. You know, many doctors, all they have to do is just text me. Rick, I have a meningioma patient, John Smith, here's the number, please see him. Done, he sent one text and the referral's been made. Doesn't have to go through the office, doesn't have to go through any of the other, you know, bureaucratic uh, red tape. Um, expedited office appointments. So this is where brain tumors tend to be a little bit different. Um, gotta see them right away. So I think most patients, when they get the diagnosis of a brain tumor, I mean, it could be a one centimeter convexity meninge, they're, they're gonna freak out. It's obviously a very scary diagnosis. And I can tell you in Florida, if someone has to wait more than a week, they're gonna go to Duke, they're gonna go to New York, they're gonna go to Chicago, they're, they're gonna leave the state if they have to wait more than a week to see someone. And so I see patients five days a week. I you know, see them you know, often um, on days where I'm operating, office tells the patients, you'll have to wait up to four hours, but he'll see you today. 
patients don't mind waiting. They just want to be seen right away. They just want to be plugged into the system. And so it's not enough that you've made that referral. You've got to see the patient right away because often if not, especially when it comes to brain tumors, you will lose that business. Spine may be different, uh, but I know with brain tumors, patients typically, once they get that diagnosis, they want to see someone within two to three days. Um, um, uh, fostering um, collaboration with the community. So I'm sure just like Miami, here at Emory, most of the patients in Atlanta don't go to Emory. Probably 90% probably of patients are treated at just small local hospitals, just like it is down in Miami. So if you're gonna isolate yourself within the university and you don't include the community, you're losing out on 90% of the business. You can't just rely on the referrals from within Emory, just like we don't rely just on the referrals within UM. So you gotta really embrace the community. And like I said, the goal is to integrate the community with the academic setting. And if you talk to private practitioners, they all want their patients seen at UM or they want them seen here at Emory. I mean, like you guys clearly have the best doctors and I think most of the physicians would like their patients seen here. But the question is why don't they refer to Emory? Why would someone in Atlanta who has a patient who needs neurosurgery not send it to Emory? And if you think about it, I'm sure it's just like UM. I've, I've asked doctors, well, we have no idea who to call. We call 1-800-MIAMI and we get referred to God knows whom. They get seen four months later. After the patient's seen, the doctor has no follow-up. They have no idea how their patient's being treated. Um, and then finally, once they're treated, the patient is just kept within the system and they, and, they, and they actually never go back to the referring doctor. So if you were that doctor, would you, would you send a patient to Emory or UM? No, I wouldn't. So how do you overcome those barriers? How do you make the physicians in the community embrace Emory, embrace Miami, and send their patients here? Well, as, I, as I've already said, you gotta always be available. Doctors have to reach you easily, not call some central neurosurgery line, which can be a huge pain. Uh, easy access, see all patients right away. Um, constant feedback, let the doctor know what the plan is. Pretty simple, it takes a simple text, an email, a phone call. Hey, saw your patient needs surgery, go home next week. I mean, it literally, it's like a 15 second phone call. And then finally, the patient has to go back to the referring doctor. I mean, that's just practice building 101, right? So if an oncologist sends me a met, and I take it out, and then I keep it within UM, why would that oncologist ever send me another met? I mean, they just wouldn't. So the patient always goes back to the referring doctor, or at least offer that to them. Um, because, because, you know, because otherwise, if a, if a doctor's losing business by sending patients your way, he's not gonna send you any more patients. And if you can embrace the community and that, and that other 90% of patients who are treated here in Atlanta outside of Emory, <clears throat> that's when you can have real growth in terms of your case volume. Um, networking, so this is critical. I store all of my contacts um, on, on Outlook, so it's always saved and you can never lose it, but obviously everyone can have their own way of saving their contacts. Uh, currently about 6,000 um, referring physicians down in South Florida who I've at some point um, you know, in, um, interacted with or, or shared patients. And this allows you to constantly update these physicians, text, emails, phone calls, so that they feel like there's a relationship there. They can ask you questions. Hey, what do you want to do with the hydrocortisone on this pituitary? What do you want to do with the, you know, Keppra on this meningioma? And having that relationship really expands referrals. Um, MRI collages, so my fellow typically puts together MRI kind of images, as, as I'll show you, kind of like before and after. That goes to all the doctors. Um, that's a small touch, it takes literally about a minute to put that collage together. Uh, and the doctors love it. They see exactly what's been done. This can be done in terms of vascular, in terms of like the pre and pre and post angio spine with the films. Um, and really fax is pointless. I, I can't emphasize that enough. If you think about communicating with fax in the year 2018, I mean faxes almost never come to my office. My assistant puts it on my desk like three days later. I read the fax. I may have a question. I now have to call this doctor because I don't have the information. He's not in the office, he has to call me back. And now you're in this cycle where you know, you're never gonna communicate with that doctor. And it's just so unbelievably inefficient. So fax, in my opinion, is completely pointless in this day and age. Gotta really open up the lines of communication over your cell phone. <coughs> it's gotta be the cell phone. If, if, if you're not willing to use your cell phone, it's very difficult in this day and age to build a practice from scratch. So, so this is an example of, of a text that I will send a doctor who, who sends me a patient. Very simple, Joe Smith doing well, no issues, neuro intact, home today, MRI confirms gross total resection of his large bifrontal meningioma recomatar. That takes literally 15 seconds. And if you are a neurologist and you get this text, why would you ever send a patient anywhere else? No other doctor's gonna do this, no one's gonna put the time in to do this, but this is what it takes. You gotta have that communication skill where 
where, where the doctor knows exactly what's going on with that patient and what the outcome is. And this has really led to even having referrals from radiologists. So this patient was three hours north with a radiologist who I've obviously never met, somewhere up in the Treasure Coast. And, and, and this patient comes to my office, one, large right-sided mass, two, go see Rick Comatar. In the MRI report, I mean, it's, it's, it's part of the medical records. I mean, I've never seen this before, but this is an example of if you take good care of patients and you communicate and the doctors know who you are, reputation begins to build and stuff like this happens. If you just operate and you never talk to the doctor and you never round on the patient, the patient can have the most amazing surgery done, but stuff like this doesn't happen if you don't go the extra step and you really communicate with all the doctors uh, with that patient. So, so this is my step-by-step -step of how I do a new patient referral. Obviously, everyone can do it differently, uh, but this is what's worked for us. Uh, so, so typically, most referrals come through my cell phone, it's a call, a text, an email. I get the name and contact info. I immediately forward that to my office. I say, have this patient see me in the next two days. They know to always book, overbook, double book, triple book. Uh, see them right away. Once I see them, I always get in touch with the doctor. Again, simple email, simple text. Sounds like a lot of work. We're all busy running around. You literally write a text, saw your patient, surgery next week, call me with questions. That will go a long way. So just communicate with them, uh, get in touch with them after the surgery. Again, two or three lines, surgery went, went well, home tomorrow, uh, see them and also text them up for <coughs> follow up. And this seems like it's a lot of work, and it is, but if you're organized and you're diligent, this really doesn't take that much time. If you're disorganized and you haven't done this before, it can take a long time. But if you build a system, this honestly, for each patient, it's five minutes a day at the most. And so you have to have a system, you have to be organized, and this type of communication goes a long way in terms of building future, future referrals. And then finally, looking at your clinical outcomes, right? So patients are your biggest referral source, okay? You gotta keep patients as your first priority, and you have to keep your complications to a minimum. So I, again, I can't stress this enough with the residents, fellows, and the junior attendings. Your reputation as a surgeon is built in the first three years, period. You come out of training, you're a little bit over-anxious, a little bit over-aggressive, you have a couple complications, which we all have, but you're a junior attending, no one's giving you benefit of the doubt. Very hard to overcome reputation of being a hack. Very hard. Even though people grow as surgeons and they improve, your first three years, in my opinion, are absolutely critical, and you gotta be safe, you gotta have good outcomes, and you gotta round twice a day. As I said before, you can do an amazing surgery, you know, very complex skull-based case, takes 12 hours, and, and then you fly out of the country the next day, and you never see the patient. That patient doesn't know how complex the surgery was. They just know that their surgeon never saw them, and they're not gonna really speak very highly about you. So, I, you know, I round twice a day. Rounds on these patients, you just literally spend 30 seconds in their room. That's all they need. Um, and I, I like, so, so I always say happy patients means more patients. Everything I said before is critical, but your biggest referral source will be your patients. So if your patients like you and they do well, they're gonna to talk to their friends. And in this day and age, everyone knows someone who knows someone who had neurosurgery. And so you have to keep your patients happy. That's your biggest referral source. Keep your outcomes good, keep your complications to a minimum. So what does that meant to our brain tumor volume at UM? So when I got there in 2011, um, brain tumor volume was kind of average, about 240 cases. Uh, and then it quadrupled over the next five years to over 1,000. Uh, making us one of the busiest brain tumor uh, centers in the U.S. These are just some of the numbers. Um, Duke's about 1,100. Miami, we, we just hit 1,000 last year. Hopkins, about 1,000. Sloan Kettering, about 900. Columbia, 800. Wash U, about 500. And so in a very short period of time, really expanded that brain tumor volume, which is the key towards, towards, towards building a comprehensive program. As I said, volume is always the first step. So here's an example. What's that five-year transformation look like for our brain tumor center, right? Building a practice is a one-man show, but what does that mean in, in terms of the bigger picture if you're building a comprehensive center of excellence? So we went from 250 up to about 1,000. And then what's all the downstream effect of the volume, which is really what you guys want to know? So we used you know, conventional surgical techniques, went to advanced cutting-edge surgical techniques, we had terrible neuropathology. We were always trying to get a new neuropathologist, but obviously if you're doing 200 cases a year, no one's listening to you. No one's gonna hire another pathologist. But once we started doing 1,000 cases, they hired a new neuropathologist quickly. Uh, and, and so now we have one of the best neuropathologists down there, and that's been a huge asset to our program. 
We had one medical neuro-oncologist, we now have three. Again, we were always pushing for that, but if you don't have the volume, why would anyone put in the resources when you haven't shown that you're gonna generate revenue? So we went from one to three medical neuro-oncologists. We had no tumor bank database. It's now one of the largest in the country. We had one clinical trial. I mean, that's pathetic. I mean, for, for a large academic center, neuro-oncology, one clinical trial, uh, and now we're up to 15. And that's, that's a direct result of bringing in the volume. We had no brain tumor researchers. We now have three dedicated NIH-funded brain tumor researchers. We only had two brain tumor publications back in 2011. We had nearly 30 this year, and that's an example of getting the residents, the fellows involved. Obviously, if there's volume, there's research, there's clinical trials, and there's a lot of case series to be published, and so that expands how much your residents are doing. We had no fellowship back when I got there. It's now uh, uh, one of the few CAST-approved neuro-oncology fellowships. And I think much like you guys have here, there's really a growth opportunity for your brain tumor center, your brain tumor institute. And if you capitalize on, on, on that, you guys have a lot of similarities with UM. And that's how you build a truly comprehensive program. And so it's a short talk. I just want to thank, obviously, the entire department um, and, in, and, and really focus on the fellows. Um, I've been lucky to have amazing fellows. And you can't build the volume without having unbelievable fellows. Um, and so just want to point out that these are the guys who really, you know, these are the engines that make, uh, make the Brain Tumor Center run. Just want to say thanks to Gustavo. As, as you heard, he, was, uh, he and I have been friends back when we were in Hopkins. A tremendous colleague, great friend, and obviously thanks for setting all this up. And then uh, obviously we'll see you guys in June. I think this is Emery's year. I really do. I really, I feel it. I feel it. I think this is the year it's going to happen. So anyway, thanks. Thank you.